I hope, is uh, an introduction to the book, which, which whets your appetite, because there's a great deal more in it, but that's just a little insight into some of the more serious aspects of the book, and some of um, the less serious aspects of the book. Um, there is, there is a, another very fun piece uh, relating to uh, a visit to the Soviet Union, which I was going to read, but I'm just conscious of time and I've taken longer than I thought I should. So, um, it's open to you. Anyone who has a comment, a question? Anyone want to get abuse off their chest? I'm available. You're an amazing man. <laughs> Thank you. The story about the Queen and Can you give us that? Oh, the story I didn't tell you about the Queen. Yeah. The Queen and Prince Philip, uh, I must say, uh, were great fun. I mean, everyone thinks that they're equally very serious people. Because I was both Minister for Defence and Minister for Justice, um, I was centrally involved in everything to do with their visit. And that meant that I found myself at a lot more events than my ministerial colleagues. Because what, what happened was um, various ministers were sort of on a rotor for, to turn up at a particular event. But you wouldn't have the whole cabinet trailing after them. But because I was in that position, uh, when the Queen, uh, her first big official event was in the Garden of Remembrance, and I was there as Minister for Defence, uh, greeting her out of the car and... Uh, when she got out of the car, she didn't just sort of look at me and grunt, she was quite chatty. And when, we, when I saw her back into her car, we ended up standing, she was, her next visit was Trinity College, and I said to her I'd be a graduate of Trinity. So we had a few minutes chat about Trinity. It was driving the security people insane because they just wanted her right in the car. So we sort of had that conversation. Then the following night there was the Dublin Castle event, which, which I mentioned. And even though she and I had already met, the formalities were everyone was in a line to be introduced to her. So having sort of had two conversations with her the previous day and seen her out of and into her car, um, Kelly and I were then formally introduced to the Queen and Prince Philip, his minister from the Shatter, blah, blah. And she looked at me and we shook hands and he shook hands and we, we sort of kept going. Now, the following night, there was a big event in the convention centre. And uh, yet again... They were lining up for a meet and greet different people. And there were, I think, three members, four members of cabinet in a, in a little block, or a mixture of cabinet and minister of state, to greet the Queen, uh, on, who hadn't met her. So I assumed that she meets so many people that she recognises nobody, you're shaking hands. I presume there was some little professional patter she engaged in with people, and, and she moved on. It, the British ambassador was doing the introductions to people on this occasion and he wasn't fully tuned in to the fact that I'd kept on meeting her and we already had conversations. So, so with great ceremonial, he said, and your majesty, this is, um, this, this is Alan Shatter, he's the Minister uh, for Defence and Justice and Equality. And she sort of looked at me and grinned. And obviously impressed with me, she said, oh no, not you again. <laughs> and she just started laughing, and I started laughing. And the other ministers were looking around, they had no idea what was going on. And so she did the shake hands with the, with the rest of the ministers. And then there was another group of people she was to say hello to had been lined up from the semi-state bodies. And as she walked over, they were all getting quite excited. And instead of accompanying her, her Prince Philip uh, stood beside me, because at this stage we'd met twice or three times. And he said to me, I really don't know why they get so excited meeting my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and they were just incredibly brilliant. And behind all of the lunacy that surrounds their lives and the formality, just human beings like the rest of us, with a sense of humour and with the capacity to recognise people. So I was just very, I was really genuinely uh, very impressed. And uh, when the whole thing was over sometime later, uh, the letter arrived thanking everybody for the security and the efficiency and all of that stuff, which I'm sure was written by one of our private secretaries, you know. So that was the Queen's story, but it wasn't really relevant to the book, so I couldn't, couldn't think of an excuse to put it into it. <laughs> yeah. This isn't relevant to the book either, but 
to do with the Queen. Um, when it was broadcast, when the dinner was broadcast and there had been the toast, yes. and everybody was clinking glasses, you could hear the Queen saying very clearly, Oh, I do like this thing, clinking of glasses. <laughs> so I just thought that was lovely. <laughs> of course, there's another fun story around the visit. You, 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 I'm sure, don't remember this. But the, there was two big issues around the visit. One would the DUP come down to Dublin to attend the dinner. Mm. And they did. And from the perspective of the peculiarities of Northern Ireland politics, this was sort of a gesture by the DUP. The other issue was, would Gerry Adams and Sinn Féin uh, attend anything? And in particular, would Gerry come along uh, to Dublin Castle? Now, they lacked the insight and intelligence to do so. Uh, what subsequently happened was on the, on the Thursday when the Queen was visiting um, Cork, uh, their Lord Ma Ma Sinn Féin, I think, uh, had the Lord Mayorship of Cork, and with much criticism from his Sinn Féin colleagues, he, he met and greeted the Queen, uh, which at the time was treated as a big, a big deal. Uh, of course, later on, Martin McGuinness and Adams met her on other occasions. So, but the big thing was when she arrived in the Garden of Remembrance, uh, the uh, uh, Sinn Féin were still not happy about the visit and certainly weren't going to participate in the visit. And I was being driven up O'Connell Street well in advance of the Queen's arrival by my guard, the driver, to be at the Garden of Remembrance to greet her. And the, we had a security cordon which ensured that no one uh, who wasn't an invited guest could get from O'Connell Street to the Garden of Remembrance. So around where the Rotunda Hospital was, there was a group of shinners all gathered, and they were carrying black balloons. And they were, and so I had a word with the guards, asked them what was going on, and said, oh, they're, they're, going to, they're going to do a protest. Uh, but the worry minister, they won't get near the Queen. And of course, they didn't get near the Queen, and the whole event went off very well in the garden, remember, she got in her car and drove off <coughs> uh, down to Trinity. So afterwards, I asked what happened. Apparently, the Guard of Intelligence had learned that their plan was that as the Queen was walking through the Garden of Remembrance up to the steps where the wreath was going to be uh, placed by her and Mary McAleese, uh, the Shinner plan was to release the black balloons. And you know, the big event would be the black balloons wandering across the Garden of Remembrance, this would get international attention and embarrass everybody. Um, they didn't count on the weather. Uh, the one thing Sinn Féin didn't control was the direction of the wind. So what I discovered afterwards, I said to the guard, one of the guards, whatever happened to the balloons, I said it was Grand Minister, they let the, uh, the balloons go, the wind blew them down on the street, no one's seen them since. <laughs> so, that, that, so that was sort of a fun, a fun thing. Yeah. Uh, what happened during your visit to the Soviet Union? I was born there, so I'm just curious what the chapter is about, if you could just okay. tell us. Okay, well, the, chapters, the chapter is about the time. I, well, I'll give you a little intro to it. I would have been together with, um, uh, and these names may be remembered by some people here, um, the Alan, and Alan Eppel, who was a friend of mine, uh, who married someone called Trish Tarkin, who's now Trish Eppel. Uh, Alan and Trish and Alan Benson, who's now deceased, and myself, and Eddie Siegel, who's still a member of the community, uh, founded something called the Irish Soviet Jury uh, Committee uh, uh, in the very early days uh, of the difficulties when the difficulties of refuseniks in the Soviet Union became well known. That organization was formed in, in 1970, and the book um, says something about that and the work it did, and then it goes further into the time when. Uh, as a TD, uh, I dealt with issues in relation to Soviet jury and describes a visit I made with a former colleague of mine, Senator Sean O'Leary, to Moscow uh, to visit um, various refusing <coughs> families. And it deals with the seriousness of that and their plight, but also in the context of our visit to the Soviet <coughs> Union, um, it details uh, one or two very funny instances that took place. Would you like me to do the funny instant I was going to do, yes. but thought we got too, a little bit too late to do it? All right, just let me find the page because it gives you a little insight uh, uh, into most of this chapter is quite serious, but this is sort of a, um, a, an amusing aside 
in, in the middle of it all. This particular incident um, creates the name of this particular chapter. So we we'll read this is only a few a couple of paragraphs or three or four paragraphs. Now, when dealing with Russian officialdom, we had been advised that being assertive and authoritative achieved better results than being docile and compliant. The hotel, this is the hotel, an interest hotel we're staying in. The hotel was organized with military precision. Breakfast, we were informed, was from eight till nine, and on day one, we were each assigned our seat at a breakfast table and requested to furnish our week's breakfast order. <laughs> Mine was two poached eggs on toast and a cup of coffee. On day two, arriving for breakfast at about 8.25, I discovered awaiting my arrival two cold poached, two cold poached eggs <laughs> sitting on top of a cold, soggy, limp piece of white toast accompanied by a cold cup of coffee. <laughs> we learned that day that at exactly 8, your breakfast order was placed at your designated place on your assigned table and remained there until you turned up. <laughs> Sitting opposite me all week was an elderly, retired, grey-haired Englishman with glasses who sat at the table with a small green backpack on his back. He told us that he was a long-standing member of the British Communist Party who was fulfilling his lifelong dream of visiting Russia. Sean labelled him as the man from the Morning Star, then a well-known British Communist publication. We managed to get to breakfast by eight on days three and four, but failed miserably on day five. We'd been out late the night before and didn't arrive for breakfast till after 8.30. I badly needed a decent cup of coffee and called over the somewhat intimidating, tall, female attendant whose job it was to service our table. I very nicely asked if she could bring me a fresh cup of coffee. She irritably stood over me, digesting my request, and then shaking her head and wagging one finger in front of my face, thundered witheringly, Von Tourist, Von Cup of Coffee. <laughs> To which I loudly responded, standing up and banging my fist on the table, I don't believe the entire Soviet Union will collapse if I'm given a second cup of coffee. <laughs> the effect was instantaneous. Morning Star Man, who had been quietly reading, jumped up startled from his seat, his glasses falling to the ground. Sean looked at me as if I'd lost my marbles, <coughs> and the attendant ran towards the coffee percolator across the room. Rapidly returning to our table, somewhat flustered, she poured me a cup of hot coffee. She did the same for Sean and then proceeded to pour coffee into the cold remains of tea sitting at the bottom of Morning Star Man's cup. <laughs> As she returned the coffee pot to its original <coughs> resting place, our English companion loudly asserted that he would not drink what he described as a bourgeois American substance. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, coffee was contaminating the purity of Soviet communism. <laughs> so that's sort of, not a serious stuff about that visit, but that was one of the lighter moments. Okay. Have I exhausted everyone? Yes. Uh, when did you decide to get involved in politics? Oh boy. That's all in there. <laughs> no, I've always believed yeah. that it was back when you were about 10 or 11. No, no, it would have happened. It, it, no, it was. It was because really? you, got, you got me out of detention. <laughs> <laughs> because it was Yom Kippur. Oh, and really? You, you represented me to the teacher, said I couldn't possibly stay back in school. Because it was Yom Kippur. It was Yom Kippur. Brilliant. <laughs> so I thought you were looking for a boat at that. No, no, I was just practicing to be a lawyer at that stage. <laughs> that's, that's what that was. Yeah, no, I. The book describes a lot of my, uh, I suppose, social activism in my years in university and some years thereafter. And uh, it was really a case of trying to persuade politicians to do stuff that they weren't doing and getting fed up talking to them and deciding if you can't persuade people from the outside, try and get on the inside. And um, the book tells part of that story in more detail than that. But no, no, as an 11 year old, I had no idea about uh, becoming a politician. And, uh, 
wasn't really sure I wanted to be a lawyer either uh, at that age. But yeah, that's a, an amazing thing to remember. Yeah. I always remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, could you say something a little bit about the process of writing the book? How it came to you? Was it easy? Was it simply a question of trying to remember chronologically your life? Or how did that work out? Yeah, place it in the context of the other book I'm doing. The other book I'm doing um, has gone to a stage where my poor study has so much paper strewn around it can't actually work in it anymore. So now the dining room has books and everything goes around. So the other book involved doing a lot of work that included research, rereading volumes of stuff that I would have read in recent years, but needing to go back into it to make sure your memory wasn't distorted, that you were presenting certain events correctly. This was a different process. Uh, literally, this was uh, written on my iPad. I just started off with some idea about the first chapter, gave some thought to where I would go with it. With writing a book, I find there are two issues. First of all, uh, the knowledge you need and the background information. And then there's how you organize that to present it. So there's a, there's a structural issue as to how you go about presenting material. And how you go about it in truthfully presenting it but trying to present it in a way that is interesting to someone who might read it. So that is, for me, that's the process. And it involves a lot of change in editing. And I had uh, two very good um, editors very close to me, in the sense that as I was producing chapters of this, um, I was throwing them at my wife, Carol, who was never slow to give me feedback, and a very good and close friend, Jane Lahan who is also extremely good at this stuff and brilliant at editing. And so uh, I think I'd have done maybe two or three chapters before either of them saw anything, and then sort of got feedback to get some insight into, even though they were close to me, just how they perceived it and where it was going. It's really a building block process. And um, <coughs> I would have done about I think I did the first seven chapters, and then I literally went back to the beginning and started editing the first seven chapters, having done bits of editing along the way, but did some serious editing and changing. And one of the things that I discovered, uh, when I say change, I mean changing presentation. Sometimes you organize material in a particular way, and you discover, because of something you're writing later on, that something you put earlier in the book actually gels better in a later location. That process, I found, brought things back to me that I hadn't remembered in the beginning. And it's sort of very strange, because if every, all of you sit here and try and project yourself back, I'm writing about some events that happened when I was three, four, five years old, which I frankly didn't think I'd remember. Um, and if you were to sit here now and, you know, can I think of something I did as a five-year-old? There might be, might be some awful event in your life that you'd never forget, but other than something really dramatic, you don't remember that much. But I, I just found that as a, as a process and as I went back into it, all sorts of things came to back to me, and uh, one thing would stimulate something else. Uh, but I was also very careful in what I wrote to do some checking. It was a much simpler process in this other book. But um, I didn't want to rely on memory for things like um, dates when people passed away, dates when I was attending particular schools. I wanted to be absolutely sure I got the name of principals correct, even spelled them correctly. Um, when it came to particular events, uh, I would be very careful to check that my date recollection uh, was accurate and not wrong. So I'd made a lot of, I, there'd been some research involved in this. I was down in the National Archives. The, I would have got assistance from various people who would have had access to verifying information or where I wanted to check. For example, uh, I had a memory of the name of one of the families that I visited in Russia. But I don't been so much involved in the Soviet jury campaign I wanted to make sure that if I was putting a reference into the book, I was absolutely accurate. So we were able to dig some stuff out of very old files that had been long put away in my offices 
um, and other stuff by going back um, into old newspaper reports. I, for example, I was able to find an Irish Times, brief Irish Times report of a press conference Sean O'Leary and myself held in 1985 after we came back from the Soviet Union where we published a report on Soviet Jury. And so I was able to uh, make sure um, that I got the season when we did this absolutely right. The things like that. So there was research involved, but not as um, complex in most instances as the other book. Um, yeah, but I, I, you also, I find when you write things, um, when you edit, you improve, improve the language. And uh, again, Jane and Carol would have read the whole book and made suggestions to me. And then um, uh, Pooh Begg has their own editor. So the publishers knew nothing about the book till the end of March. I thought I had a completed book which required about two months refining by me. And there was no, nothing was organised for it to be published or anything else. They were delighted with it. Uh, I gave it to them five days later. They said, yes, please, thank you very much. You want to publish it? And I said, that's fine, but I'll be editing now this through to July. And um, they gave it to their own editor, and there was some interaction between both of us. And very helpful things come back where you, you write. I tend, unlike my speaking, to be quite brief when I write things. I can write things with brevity. So one of the messages that came back was, it would be interesting to expand on certain things, give some more information about them. And my concern would have been that this could be too long and maybe boring to read. So it was great to have then someone who didn't know me who read it in Blue Bag and said, well, look, why don't you, um, you know, do some, a little bit more of that. And in the end, the book is published, um, is about 10,000 10, words longer than the book they got at the end of March. So that was a very, very valuable process. And some of what I added into the book was what wasn't prompted by editing. It was just, I was now relaxed about it. I had a finished work. And it was like, what's missing from this? Um, and I, still, I tell a story of my family background, which involved telling the story of Lodz in Poland and what happened, and the extermination of Lodz jury in the concentration camps. And um, in telling that story, I was very careful about ensuring uh, accuracy of information. And, and for example, Jan Fashem has wonderful source material if you want to check into it to make sure uh, what you're writing is accurate. So, so that, that, was, that was really the process. Um, but I'm really bad because I'm never happy. I mean, I could look at this now and think of what I left out that I'd like to put in. And literally, the day the printing presses were supposed to be rolling on this, um, Gay Shortland is the name of the pool bag editor. I got on to her about a sentence I wasn't happy with. And could we just change the last three words, please? Because I was concerned that the way I'd phrased it um, may not have been accurate in, in portraying something. And just a change of three words, it sure there was no <coughs> doubt about it actually. Yeah, so I'm a little fastidious about stuff like that to the point of driving people, I think, a little bananas. But they were very good and tolerant of me. So, and, and unfortunately, since I've found two, two typographical errors in the book. So there's, there's the, but I've never published a book yet that doesn't have, yeah, it's impossible. There's always something, some word goes wrong. And one of them is a, is, a, is a footnote that no one will read, which has one little error in it, and one is buried somewhere in the text. And I suspect I'm the only person ever notice. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, I have uh, one question for you, because you said about the 10, when he was 10, the, the kids said to you, dirty Jewish or something. I'd like to know if this uh, affect you to be who you are today, if you want to revenge by the law. If I want to? Revenge by the law, or because what's happened, and to prove not only for yourself, but the other people who you, as a Jewish, who, you, who we are. I, I have a very simple view of the world. There are some people in the world, unfortunately, who are anti-Semites. Um, there always have been. Um, I think you get on with your own life and you make your judgments and you adopt your own values and character and you don't get thrown by people who behave that way. You don't let them colour your perspective on the world and you don't, um, but also you don't ignore uh, anti-Semitism and it's evil and 
how it can impact on communities, and we saw the ultimate evil uh, in Nazi Germany. Um, but in, in the context of my growing up as a child in Ireland, um, that would have been a very isolated event. It wasn't the only occasion um, I heard someone uh, who was Jewish called a dirty Jew, but in the context of of Ireland, by and large, it was an isolated event. But I do deal in my book uh, with um, uh, a particular Irish politician who was uh, quite clearly in his young days rapidly anti-Semitic, um, and my experience uh, as a politician over the years is that there have been occasions when I've been very viciously targeted by anti-Semites. Um, what you need to do is stand up to people like that and you need to confront it uh, as opposed to um, be intimidated by it. Uh, look, we had, when I was Minister for Justice, we had uh, an employee of the Dublin City Council who sent a series of anonymous anti-Semitic uh, emails to the Department of Justice. That man ended up being identified and prosecuted and I think he was given a suspended sentence. Um, we had uh, substance sent to my home, uh, which the army had to uh, deal with. And the second time that was attempted, uh, it was found in a local post office. In all those occasions, there were anti-Semitic messages that accompanied that. And I had an instance in the Doyle in years gone by when there was at least um, uh, two different Fianna Fáil TDs who made anti-Semitic comments and there was a, a Sinn Féin TD who made anti-Semitic comment and it generated an amount of, uh, of publicity. Uh, you do one of two things, you either um, ignore it, which I don't believe you should do, I think you should confront it and take people on who conduct themselves that way when it's appropriate. Maybe that's the lesson I learned as a child. I, 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 um, yeah, I, I, it was actually surprising. That incident happened when I was very young. Um, and it has truly always been something I remember. And I'm sure I don't remember too much from that age group. I was about 10 at the time. I'm sure I don't remember too much that happened when I was 10 years old. But that just stands out as a particular incident. To the extent I remember that we used to have, until very recently, a big department store called Cleary's in O'Connell Street, which uh, ceased to operate his business about 18 months ago now or two years ago. I actually remember I got on that bus outside a bus stop, uh, at a bus stop outside Cleary's department store. I have a very clear memory of that day and when I got on the bus and I sort of have an image in my head of the guy I had that conversation with, even though I've never seen him again since. So yeah, to what extent, I don't know, your guess is as good as mine to what extent that impacted on my future perspective on the world. I, I think it might have done to some extent as we're talking about it now. I think that's interesting, yeah. Question about, a, a little off the subject, what's the attitude in government about Israel and Israel, the Israel-Palestinian conflict? Do we have three hours? <laughs> <laughs> the, let, let, me, let me try and deal with this in a succinct way. My experience of Irish politicians, including members of my own <coughs> party, is that they have a superficial knowledge of the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, my impression is also that they're at risk of being unduly influenced by populist pro-Palestinian bias that comes from uh, the sort of the activist uh, wing in Ireland who have a narrow view of what's going on and who present themselves as pro-Palestinian. I think being a member of the European Union uh, has forced Irish politicians who find themselves involved in Europe to develop a more nuanced attitude. But I never ever cease to be amazed how little knowledge they actually personally knew. Um, much of the time, whoever happens to be the foreign minister is reliant on the brief they get from their civil servants. There is, within the Department of Foreign Affairs, a dichotomy of perspectives on the conflict. 
I find that um, Irish diplomats who have uh, been appointed to the Irish Embassy in Tel Aviv, uh, particularly those who have been appointed as ambassadors, um, come back to Ireland uh, with a very detailed knowledge and would probably be perceived by their colleagues as having gone native and become pro-Israeli. The, the Irish appointees to the Palestinian Authority, who will have an office in Ramallah, seem to come back pro-Palestinian. And the sort of swings and roundabouts within that department when it comes to the um, expertise that can be gleaned from briefings. I've seen briefings given, because I was the recipient of one or two of them, uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, which could at their most charitable be described as deficient in, in the sense of um, presenting a narrow view of complex issues. So there is a problem in how Ireland has approached that issue. I found that um, when I was in cabinet, people were very careful when it came to dealing with Israeli-Palestinian uh, issues because they would have known not just of my views, but that I had a considerable knowledge in the area. Um, yeah, but Ireland hasn't, hasn't always performed with, um, in a manner in which we can be proud of in addressing the issue. But other people haven't either in other areas. And uh, this is all a topic all to its own. I mean, maybe one night we'll have a session or one afternoon on you know, my view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I've deliberately not said what my view is and where it's going to and what the problems are. Um, but yeah, the knowledge, the knowledge is on occasion deficient. The capacity for Ireland to interfere in a manner that's counterproductive is limited to how Ireland conducts itself at European Union level. And Israel has enough good friends at European Union level for Ireland, uh, if Ireland isn't helpful, not to be able to do damage. I, I have for long explained to some of my colleagues how Ireland could behave differently and be taken more seriously as a proper, as a, as a, as a possible assistant in at least getting Palestinians to understand how to go about a productive peace process. There's a role Ireland can play there. Uh, I know, and I know our Israeli ambassadors here will be terribly diplomatic, but from all of the conversations that I've had on various visits over many years to Israel with politicians, um, in all of the parties and some of the very leading ones, uh, as far as Israel as a state is concerned, um, Ireland is of no help in their perception generally and is of little limited relevance and generally causes them a problem. Now that, that's not true in one or two other areas, but Ireland certainly isn't seen as a state that Israel um, gets too many positive uh, vibes back from. I think that's the best way of putting it. But uh, um, an Irish success of different governments bear um, the the uh, blame for that. I think the government I was in for three years. I'm not just saying it's because I was in it. <laughs> I think it did less damage than some of its predecessors may have done to Ireland-Israel relations. Um, I'm not convinced that in the context of one or two recent visits that they necessarily conducted themselves the way they should, because uh, too frequently people are pandering to activists in Ireland, and that's the problem. There you are. Yes? Um, do you foresee that Sinn Féin may get some sort of reins of power within government, be it an alliance or something? And if so, what effect do you think that will have on Israel-Irish relationships? Well, I think for as long as Michal Martin is leader of Sinn Féin, uh, is leader of Fianna Fáil, <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip, I think for as long as Michal Martin is leader of Fianna Fáil, it is now very unlikely that Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil will get into government together. A couple of years ago, I would have had a different view. I thought the world was heading into a space 
where at the next election, uh, if Sinn Féin did well and Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin made up the numbers, that would be the next government. But Martin has put himself so far out on a limb now, no matter what the result of an election is, I don't see how that could happen. I think Sinn Féin could end up in government with a differently led Fianna Fáil. Um, and the level of support Fin, uh, Sinn Féin is getting is an increasing concern. And whatever difficulties Israeli governments have had with Irish governments, Sinn Féin in government would just make life a lot worse. But from an Israel perspective, um, Ireland's a small little country, the back end of Europe, and uh, if, Ireland, if Israel decides to want to ignore Ireland, is, Israel can ignore Ireland. I mean, it's simple to be realistic about as simple as that. Um, Will Sinn Féin end up in government at some stage? Well, I've given up on political prophecies because I've discovered, I used to think I was a prophet when it came to predicting elections, and I've discovered um, I'm not very good at prophecy anymore because the Irish political scene has become so uncertain and so volatile. But yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be a good thing. The other, the other thing that I should say when it, to a talk about Israel and Ireland, um, the Irish Defence Forces are very interesting, as Minister for Defence. Uh, they do play quite an important role in UN missions around the Middle East. We have some of them up on the Golan, we have some of them in South Lebanon, we have a few of them in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, they are playing a role of some value as members of the UN, and they play a very non-partisan non role. Now, I know uh, from Israel's perspective, they would like to see Unifil in southern Lebanon um, uh, confronting Hezbollah and trying to prevent the accumulation of weaponry in southern Lebanon. This is a constant issue of concern. Um, but Ireland is making a positive contribution in that context. And from everything I have seen uh, within our defence forces, there's absolutely no doubt that the Irish Defence Forces have a full and comprehensive understanding of the realities of life in the Middle East and with regard to Israel and its neighbouring states, Israel and Palestinians. Uh, in fact, there is some very real tension between the Department of Defence that you never ever see in public and the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, on those issues. Um, and the tension hyped up a bit more when I was Minister for Defence. Mm -hmm. And frankly, we didn't stand for some of the nonsense. Uh, when I was off on visits to Israel, I was getting briefings from the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, which mostly I read for my personal interest and amusement, and then hit the dustbin and never accompanied me on visits because the, that was, there was a problem with them. Uh, whereas there was a far more sophisticated understanding within defence. Uh, so we, we upended the balance a little bit for three years because they're supposed to be equal departments, but foreign affairs were always arrogant enough to think the Department of Defence was subservient to them. So we had three years when it wasn't, which was sort of fun, and the officials enjoyed that. <laughs> okay, are we done? No. Yeah. Just following up on this gentleman's question, uh, to what extent do you think our default position, which appears to be kind of an anti-Israeli uh, view in that conflict is due to the fact that we ourselves are a young, uh, relatively young country that was colonised and we, we, our default position seems to be to defend uh, or uh, to defend what we perceive to be the oppressed, which is not always... Well, well, the official Irish position is more complex than that. The official Irish position is we want to see uh, peace between Israel and Palestinians, we want the conflict resolved, uh, the Irish state favours the two-state solution. All of this is in line with the general international perspective within Europe um, and also within America, subject to the vagaries of Trump. But there's nothing wrong with any of that. Um, and it's a, a position I entirely, entirely agree with. Where it goes wrong is in the nuances. There, there's a failure to understand the full impact, for example, on Israeli society of terrorism. There's a an elevation of the existence of what are referred to as settlements as being the major obstacle to a peace process, as opposed to viewing the major obstacle to the peace process being a lack of trust between Israeli and Palestinian leaders, Israel's concern about 
the nature of ed the education Palestinian children are getting, the failure on the Palestinian side to um, educate their own population to bring about a degree of compromise on the basis of the original aims of Fatah or Hamas cannot be achieved, uh, the, the uh, glorifying of terrorism and martyrdom. Now, there's an interesting role Ireland could play here because as someone who has politically no time for Sinn Féin or Sinn Féin politics and abhors their history of being involved in killing people, there's one thing that Sinn Féin achieved which was a piece of brilliant politics and it's the only way to bring about a peace process. It's the one thing that if, if Ireland uh, if Irish politicians wanted to contribute something positive to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolution, uh, they don't need to involve themselves with Israel on this. They could take this one lesson, because a lot of rubbish is talked about, you know, the Irish peace process can solve the Israeli-Palestinian people, it can't. What's happening out there is so much more complex than what's happening here. But there's one bit of it. For a, no a number of years, Sinn Féin did a very odd thing, which at the time as a politician I was usually cynical about. Before the final peace agreement, which brought about an end to violence on the island of Ireland, except for the very small group of lunatics who separated from the provisional IRA in Sinn Féin, for about three years at least, Sinn Féin ran a peace campaign. Now many of us were cynical of this because the IRA were still bombing people when Sinn Féin was running a peace campaign. But we used to have members of Sinn Féin outside Ernst House protesting in favour of peace. Now, the peace they wanted was some arrangement put in place to resolve their conflict. But don't forget, they were protesting in favour of peace. Their original aim was the United Ireland. Their peace protest ended up turning into a peace protest that got their own members to accept something falling <coughs> dramatically short of a united Ireland, something that created uh, a separate assembly and executive in Northern Ireland, and which essentially gave the unionist population a veto on a united Ireland, because there can't be one until the majority in the North have voted for a, uh, a united Ireland. But Sinn Féin and the provisional IRA were peopled by individuals committed to united Ireland and willing to engage in murder and mayhem to achieve it. And they ended up ending the violence without achieving their objectives. And they will say, well, they achieved some equality of esteem in Northern Ireland in the context of the way the executive works. It's not one community ruling the other. <coughs> when the executive is working, as it isn't at the moment, it's, it's a bi-community uh, form of government, which, which is true. But they travelled a huge distance in getting their own supporters and some of their very wild men and women who are happy to blow up and kill people into accepting compromise. The problem is, on the side of Fatah and certainly Hamas, that isn't the narrative. There's a narrative we want a two-state solution, but there's no pre preparation being done to bring about peace. Now that's something that if, in Ireland we could be talking to the, the Palestinian side about, uh, to, to encourage them down that road, to encourage them in their education material in their schools, to actually include Israel on the map as an existing state, not to teach their children that the obliteration of Israel is an objective to be achieved, um, not create an illusion that people who owned, uh, who, who, whose forefathers may have come from Petach uh, Tikva uh, or Tel Aviv or Jerusalem are going to go back to an old house somewhere. And there's a need for everyone to understand the importance of compromise and achieving peace. And that is a role that we could be playing. One of the interesting conversations I had quite a few years ago now on my visits to Israel over the years, I would have, I don't know how many times I visited Ramallah, a lot of times I would have met Arafat a number of times, I've met Abbas, I've met Saeb Erekat, who's their chief negotiator, I've met uh, his predecessor who was negotiating, and Erekat was doing, there was swapping around the negotiators, and I've met some of the other senior Palestinians, as well as many Israeli politicians, but one of my abiding memories was a, and I don't want to reveal anyone's identity, was what I would describe as a pre-2011 <coughs> conversation, prior to my being government minister. I uh, met one of the leading Palestinians, who at that stage, 
who had some sort of sense of optimism that there could be a resolution of the conflict, which I personally didn't think was realistic, but he had a sense of optimism. And I was having breakfast with him in his kitchen. And he said to me, you know the problem, don't you? And I said, well, what's the problem? He said to me, the problem is that if I'm right, that he's right, and if there's an agreement concluded which solves our, our problems, and if it's based on Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza at that stage, I don't think Gaza was likely incorporated because Hamas had taken it over. Uh, he said, the problem is I'll be a dead man within a month. Because of all the, because uh, of the perception of so many Palestinians. That there are, and he said, I won't survive to see this implemented. I'll be shot dead. And the Palestinian leaders are their own worst enemies in that context, in the narrative that they give to their own people, which is often different to the narrative that they express internationally when they meet uh, international politicians. So, here we are. Yes? Oh, sorry. Could you just repeat that? Because I thought maybe you needed to put some more. I didn't hear. It was fascinating that last time. Could you just repeat that? No, I said one of the people in the leadership position from the Palestinian side, who I would have uh, met for breakfast, and who uh, some years ago was optimistic that there could be a resolution, at a time when I didn't think that was realistic, said to me, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it, he said, you know the problem that if we achieve the agreement, I'll be a dead man within a month. Because of the extremists? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But also I view it because they haven't done the preparatory work with their own population necessary to understand how you bring about a two-state solution uh, and get on with your lives positively rather than still see it as an objective uh, to eliminate the Israeli state or in some shape or form. And primarily with education, educating the future generations. Well, well, it's the education that's going on currently within the schools which is of concern because it isn't an education that would create an adult population in favour of compromise resolution. That's a real problem. I, I think my voice is going. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank you so much, Alan, for being with us. I think we'd all agree it's been a real treat to have Alan with us in the museum on our Sunday afternoon series. And I, I'm just worried so that much. I'm becoming a museum piece. <laughs> <laughs> We're far from it, trust me. So um, we wish you, of course, the very best of this book. It's been fascinating to hear you read excerpts from it. And I hope everybody will buy a copy. It's really a great read. And I, will you stay a little while? You've been so generous with I your time. I will stay back yes. and anyone wants to buy copy, I'll happily, happily sign it, and for those who are really lucky, I can spit on the second page as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you say you've gone home with Shatter's DNA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.